So do juries make better decisions than individual jurors? Obviously a verdict is returned by the jury as a group. Individual jurors' decisions are not accepted as a verdict. But there's a reasonably substantial body of research comparing the decisions of individuals to the decisions of groups, not just in the context of jury decision making. So even though the jury group returns a verdict, it's worth considering how the group deliberation process might influence jurors' decisions. Now we touched on this in the last video. In this video, we'll focus not just on the characteristics of group deliberation, but also the psychology behind group discussion to understand whether groups make better decisions than individuals. Intuitively, it might be tempting to think that this is not a difficult question to answer. Two heads are better than one, after all, as the saying goes. And so it might seem that groups must make better decisions than individuals. The results of a relatively early study by Kaplan and Miller in 1978 would support this idea. They found that the effect of stereotypes about defendants was reduced following jury deliberation. So in essence, the group deliberation helped jurors move beyond their preconceptions about the defendant and make decisions based on other information, presumably the evidence. Now, but don't forget that other saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. Let's see what the rest of the research on group decision making says about this issue. Well, one area of potentially relevant research you may have already heard about in the popular media is called groupthink. According to Janus, groupthink is a mode of thinking that can occur in highly cohesive, high status groups in which the desire to reach a unanimous agreement overrides the motivation to adopt proper, rational decision making procedures. Several famous instances of poor group decision making have been given as examples of groupthink by commentators over the years. The Challenger shuttle disaster, the Columbia shuttle disaster, the weapons of mass destruction case against Iraq, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, and also the escalation of the Vietnam War. Groupthink is triggered by directive leadership style, intense group cohesion, similarity of ideology within the group, pressure for unanimity in decision making, insulation of the group from critics, insecure group member self-esteem, and a sense of crisis. It is thought to typically occur in very high status groups where other group members are viewed as powerful and wise. Now, group members are therefore likely to keep any objections to themselves and so dissent becomes stifled. Groupthink results in several inadequate decision processes. For example, an inadequate consideration of the alternative decision options, ignoring the implications of failure, and a biased assessment of the risks, costs, and benefits. There's also poor information search and meagre contingency planning in the event that the group solution fails. Now, there's actually mixed support for the concept of groupthink. For example, manipulating cohesion to be high should promote uh, groupthink. But Esser's 1998 research did not find any evidence that this was the case. Increased threat to the group should also enhance groupthink, but Fodor and Smith's 1982 research didn't find any effect of heightened threat. On the other hand, Esser's 1998 research did find that, as would be expected, directive leadership and group insulation from outside critics do produce uh, characteristics of groupthink, such as poorer decision making. Mullen and colleagues in 1994 argued that all of the preconditions for groupthink must be present before the effects and symptoms of groupthink will be seen. So does this mean that groupthink exists or not? And does it apply to the jury decision-making context? Well, such research suggests that groupthink probably only applies in a more narrow range of circumstances than originally thought. Given the preconditions for groupthink, it seems quite unlikely that groupthink would exert a strong influence in the jury context. For example, it's perhaps unlikely that all members of a jury would view the other members as particularly powerful and wise on the topic of under discussion, which is the verdict. Having said that, the research on groupthink does identify a number of things that might mitigate the more negative aspects of group decision making. For example, the importance of dissent via the sharing of divergent ideas and opinions via a devil's advocate, and also the importance of a group leader not advocating a position early in the discussion. Now, we'll come back to these ideas shortly, but first, let's look at some other areas of research on group decision making to see what effect group discussion might have on the quality of a group's decision. Group polarization is one such area of research. Group polarization was originally studied by Moscovici and Savaloni in 1969. This is the phenomena where the group discussion tends to intensify a group's opinion. So, individual group members' original attitudes become more extreme following group discussion. The reason why this phenomenon might be more relevant to jury decision making uh, than groupthink is because it's not limited to high status or highly cohesive groups. 
However, for it to take effect, group members must basically agree on the favoured side of the issue at first. So they must basically agree on how to interpret the evidence. The research shows that group polarisation intensifies many kinds of attitudes, such as feminism, pacifism, equality, underage drinking, racial attitudes, and more relevantly, the perceived guilt or innocence of defendants in criminal trials. Now, there are a few explanations for why group polarisation might occur. The first is called persuasive arguments theory and was originally put forward by Bernstein and Vinica in 1977. The idea is that if there's a generally agreed upon group position at the start of the group discussion, group members are more likely to hear arguments consistent with their own personal views. The preponderance of these arguments persuades group members that their views are correct, especially when some of these arguments are new to group members. And so, as a consequence, their attitudes become more extreme. So group members are influenced by the new information. Kaplan in 1997 and Diamond and Casper in 1992 argued that this was the explanation for group polarisation in the context of jury decision making. An alternative perspective is based on Festinger's social comparison theory. When there isn't an objective standard to compare your views against to see if they're correct, we compare our views to those of the other group members. In this case, the group norm is important, rather than the exchange of information in the form of persuasive arguments. The idea goes that if there is a pre-existing group norm, group members will be reluctant to deviate from it. In fact, group members try to be above average in terms of their adherence to the group norm to show that they are good group members. Now, most group members assume they're already better than the average group member and think that their individual attitudes demonstrate their standing as a good group member. Group discussion may, however, disconfirm this belief when group members hear that other group members hold pretty much the same attitudes, and so they find out that they are merely an average group member. Group members then adopt more extreme attitudes in an attempt to become better than the average group member. As a result, the group's decision also becomes more extreme. So which of these two theories about group polarisation is most accurate? Well, it turns out that there's evidence that both are correct in some circumstances. Support for the social comparison explanation can be seen in Barron and colleagues' 1996 research. Those findings suggest that arguments don't have to be new to the group members. Polarisation occurs even if group members just find out that others agree with their choices. Likewise, for Stewart and Stass's 1998 finding that polarisation is observed even if group members only find out that they share some of the reasons for their views. Both of these effects seem to be related to an increase in confidence. In fact, we can see some evidence of group polarisation in Barron and Rogers' 1976 study even when no arguments at all are exchanged. On the other hand, Bernstein and Vinicius' 1973 study clearly showed evidence of polarisation only when persuasive arguments were exchanged by group members, even, even when there was explicitly no information available about the actual attitudes of other group members, and so there could be no group norm to compare oneself to. A final perspective on group polarisation comes from self-categorisation theory. According to Hogg, Turner and Davison in 1990, people express stronger views when they discover they are shared by others because they want to be liked. Group discussion promotes greater awareness of group affiliation. In effect, it increases the salience or prominence of the group identity. And group members make more effort to adhere to the prototypic group norms. Now, rather than thinking about the merits of the arguments for one viewpoint or another, group members focus on the norm that embodies the group. Now, in an intergroup setting, this norm is a position that maximises the similarity within the group and minimises similarity to other groups. This is different from the social comparison explanation because group members are not trying to be better than each other, they're just trying to distinguish the, their group from other relevant outgroups. There's quite a bit of research supporting this view. One of the key studies by Spears and colleagues in 1990 showed that group polarisation only occurs when group salience is high. So one would have to consider whether this would be the case in a jury deliberation setting. Do jury members see themselves as members of a group? And in this example, who would be the relevant outgroup? Okay, so it seems that groups might make individuals' decisions more extreme for a number of reasons, including exposure to biased information, that is, one side of the issue, comparison with other group members, and also comparison with other groups. So let's take a look at that first mechanism in a little more detail. 
and it is probably one of the most relevant for thinking about how juries make decisions and why their decisions might polarise. So the research suggests that individuals are influenced by the flow of arguments in the group discussion and this information flow can be biased in that it tends to justify the side of the argument favoured by most group members. This biased flow influences attitude extremity. According to Stasser and Titus in 1987, one of the consequences of these processes is that there is a tendency to emphasise shared information rather than otherwise important information known only by individual jurors. The problem with this was identified by Stasser in 1988 in a phenomena called hidden profiles. This is where the information held in common by group members favours one choice, while the unshared information held by each group member contradicts that group choice. That unshared information is called the hidden profile because it does not typically emerge during the group discussion. It stays hidden while the group discusses the shared information. Now, rationally, the group should rely on the information in the hidden profile when making their decision. However, due to group processes such as conformity, normative influence and polarisation favouring the expression of shared information, the uniquely held information stays hidden. Let's consider an example to illustrate this. Imagine a jury of six trying to decide what verdict to return, guilty or not guilty. Suppose that all six jurors remember three bits of evidence in favour of conviction. Now importantly, each juror remembers the same three bits of evidence as the other jurors. This is the shared information. Now also imagine that each of these six jurors remembers one piece of evidence that favours acquittal or a not guilty verdict. For these bits of information, each juror remembers a different unique bit of evidence. So at the individual juror level, each juror should favour conviction because they all remember three bits of evidence that favour conviction and one bit that favours acquittal. When the jurors discuss the case as a jury, if they effectively pooled all of their knowledge, they would actually favour acquittal because there are three commonly held bits of information for conviction and six uniquely held bits of information for acquittal. Unfortunately, groups often don't effectively pool their information and instead they rely on the shared common information. This biased group discussion can lead to more extreme attitudes through confirmation of group members' views, inflated estimates of group agreement, overconfidence and less extensive generation of ideas and poor decision making. So how can the effects such as hidden profiles and polarisation be avoided? Well, one promising option seems to be encouraging dissent in the group. This dissent might be genuine or contrived, as in the devil's advocate technique. Although both work, Nemeth and colleagues' 2001 research shows that authentic dissent produces more ideas and solutions than contrived techniques. According to Greitemeyer and colleagues' 2006 findings, dissent works because it encourages discussion in the group, increases pooling of unshared information and allows for solving of hidden profiles. It also, however, decreases both individuals' satisfaction with the task outcome and willingness to work with group members in the future. As Schultz, Hart and colleagues showed in 2002, dissent also decreases group morale and causes delays in decision making and decreases group cohesion. Thus, despite the apparent benefits of dissent for the quality of the group's decision, group members may be reluctant to encourage it. Ryan Bale and McKimmy in 2012 confirmed that dissent in group decision making helps to produce objectively better group decisions by undermining group members' confidence in their initial preferences. As a result, they focus more carefully on evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of the information rather than relying on heuristic cues when making a decision. A follow-up study also suggested that the presence of deviance in the group helps solve the hidden profile and move beyond relying on the shared information when making a decision. The negative effects of dissent on the group were evident in that 2012 research, however. Uh, another follow-up study, also published in 2014, showed that when the group was working under a unanimous decision rule compared to a majority rule, the negative effects of deviance were actually much reduced. So it seems that under some conditions, group deliberation can actually make individuals' decisions potentially less reliable due to biased information sampling and group processes. However, those same group processes can be brought to bear in the form of group deviance to promote better, more thorough group decision making. Unanimous decision rules, somewhat paradoxically, seem to encourage the group to have to engage with the deviant group member in a productive manner, rather than sidelining him or her, as might be done in the case of majority decision rule.